good afternoon good morning good evening uh, ladies and gentlemen for those uh, joining us from different parts of the world today my name is alexandra matas i'm the deputy head of the diplomatic dialogue at the geneva center for security policy we are an international non-profit foundation physically based in uh, geneva switzerland our foundation council is comprised of 53 states, including all the United Nations Security Council, P5. We are impartial, independent, and inclusive, and the census mission is to promote peace and international security, and to prepare and transform individuals and organizations so that they can create a safer world. And this is done on several, several parallel tracks, through executive education, providing through providing platform for track 1.5 and track 2 dialogues, and through policy advice. So I'm pleased to welcome you all for this uh, hybrid event. We launched today the report on cooperative security entitled Restoring European Security from Managing Relations to Principled Cooperation. For the audience that we have physically here in the room, uh, you can uh, have the uh, paper copies uh, at the entrance to the room and my colleagues also will uh, share a link to the PDF document in the chat box. The Cooperative Security Initiative or the CSI was designed to generate ideas and shift momentum in favor of cooperative security and multilateralism in order to build a safer Europe. The CSI uh, is conceptualized and implemented by two institutions Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, Regional Office for Cooperation Peace in Europe, and they are partners for organizing today's event and represented here by Dr. Reinhard Krum, as well as Globsec, a think tank, which is based in Bratislava. The report was drafted by several policy experts from across Europe and North America, and we are very honored to have the contributors to this report with us on the panel today, joining us physically, but also virtually uh, through uh, Zoom link. Uh, we believe that it is a very timely discussion given the erosion in relations between Russia and the West that has intensified in the uh, last few years. It brought instability, high risks of military confrontation in the region, and uh, in the situation where a high level of polarization and mistrust persist, there is a need for an inclusive dialogue process on European security. The recent US-Russia uh, summit held in Geneva on 16th of June has given a new impulse to the relations between uh, the two countries. And maybe there is a new opportunity to restore dialogue on a number of important issues that come to light. So we have gathered uh, today an excellent panel of speakers and I will introduce them now in the order uh, of their presentations. Uh, Ambassador Thomas Greminger, who is director of the Geneva Center for Security Policy. He took over this position in May this year after serving for three years as the Secretary General of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the OEC. Prior to that, he was also permanent representative of Switzerland to the OEC in Vienna. And during the Swiss chairmanship in 2014, he chaired the OEC Permanent Council, where he played an active role in addressing the crisis in and around Ukraine. Ambassador Greminger has also been deputy director and head of the South Cooperation Department of the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation, the SDC. To my left, Dr. Reinhard Krum, uh, who is the founder and director of the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung Regional Office for Cooperation and Peace in Europe, based in Vienna. And uh, Reinhard joined us from Vienna. He came from Vienna today. Thank you very much for traveling uh, here to Geneva. He joined uh, Friedrich Ebert Stiftung in 2002, serving as director of the offices in Tashkent and Moscow, later heading the Department of Central and Eastern Europe in Berlin. Dr. Krum is also a lecturer on Russian and Eastern European history in Regensburg University and holds an honorary uh, professorship from the Department of Political Science at Moscow State University. 
Now I would like also to introduce our speakers uh, joining us online. Uh, Dr. Matthew Rojanski, who is the director of the Cannon Institute of the Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington. Um, he has advised governments, intergovernmental organizations, and major private actors on conflict resolution and efforts to enhance shared security throughout the Euro-Atlantic and Eurasian region. Previously, Dr. Rozhansky was deputy director of the Russia and Eurasia program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And uh, as far as understood, Matt is joining us today from Vermont. And uh, thank you very much for being with us so early in the day. Uh, our next speaker is joining us from Moscow uh, today, Dr. Andrei Kortunov, who is uh, the Director General of the Russian International Affairs Council, REAC. It is a nonprofit partnership established by the order of the President of the Russian Federation. Previously, he was deputy director of the Institute of U.S. and Canadian Studies of the Russian Academy of Sciences, and he's the founder and first president of the Moscow Public Science Foundation. And last but not least, Dr. Fred Tanner, uh, who is the research associate at the Center on Conflict Development and Peacebuilding at the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva. Uh, Fred. Uh, is usually based in Switzerland, but is joining us today from Vienna. Thank you very much for that, Fred. Uh, he's also Associate Fellow of the GCSP and was Director of our Center for seven years. Dr. Tana has extensive work experience with the OEC and served, among other responsibilities, as Senior Advisor to the Secretary General. And he currently serves on the advisory board of the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung Regional Office for Cooperation Peace in Europe. So now, before giving the floor to Ambassador Greminger for his opening remarks, just a few housekeeping uh, rules. This is a public event, and you heard already that it is uh, being recorded. It will be recorded until the uh, Q&A session, then we will stop uh, recording. The link to this <coughs> event will be afterwards available on YouTube and also on social media. After panelist presentation, we will be taking your questions. I will be collecting questions both from uh, uh, audience here and from uh, our audience joining online. Uh, I remind you for, uh, for the uh, Zoom audience to uh, type your questions in the Q&A box, which is on the bottom of your screen, and you can uh, ask your questions already during the discussion, during the presentations, and my colleagues will help me to voice those questions afterwards. So on this, I, I wish us all a fruitful discussion, and I would like to give you the floor, Thomas, please. Thank you, Sasha. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, uh, friends, welcome to GCSP also on my behalf. Uh, Welcome to the launch of the Corporate Security Initiative Report. Uh, we are doing it uh, in a hybrid format because the topic of cooperative security is too important to wait until the sanitary situation would again allow us to meet fully in, in person. The idea for this corporate Cooperative Security Initiative came up at a working breakfast I had with Andrei Kortunov uh, in fall 2017 when I visited Moscow for the first time as second channel of the OEC. We brainstormed, brainstormed uh, on ways to make cooperative security again more mainstream in security policy thinking. We pondered different options and we, uh, at the end, favored a process, a track to a process that would be run by leading think tankers. It did then not take much to convince Reinhard Krumm to pick the idea up and to further develop it. He then eventually partnered with Globsec, not least uh, with the view 
of the slow-up OEC chairmanship in 2019 and also with a view of, of, of getting the political endorsement by uh, Slovak's uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs and, and Chair in Office, uh, Miroslav Leiter. The Friedrich Hesselt Foundation and GlobSec then together managed uh, to bring 18 absolutely outstanding think tanks and think tankers on board of the process. And I, I think it's not pretentious to say they brought the leading uh, think tankers on on uh, board of the process. And I'm very pleased uh, that we have two of the most outstanding experts, uh, Matt Rochansky and Andrei Kogunov, uh, here today on our panel. Today's event uh, is the start of a series of conversations that I would like uh, to hold here at the GCSP on cooperative security. Uh, we would like to do that in partnership uh, with uh, uh, partners in the United States, in Russia, in Europe, uh, and um, building on these building blocks suggested by the Cooperative Security Initiative Report. Cooperative security is not a new concept. As a matter of fact, it's uh, quite an old one. It is uh, a concept that unfortunately has gotten into oblivion in, in recent times. It has, however, quite a compelling track record. Uh, it contributed in a very significant way uh, in managing uh, uh, the Cold War. Uh, period, helping us uh, find a way out of the Cold War. And it also uh, provided us, or it at least contributed to, to providing us with relative peace and stability over much of the post-Cold War period. Cooperative security is uh, not rocket science. It's a relatively simple concept. Um, it basically implies that states work together in addressing uh, security threats. Contrary to the concept of collective uh, security, uh, cooperative security is not about forging an alliance, uh, a defensive alliance against someone, but it is about who do we need to cooperate with to respond to particular security challenges. There is a broad range of security risks uh, uh, where states need to cooperate. Let me just mention a few. Climate change and environmental degradation. Uh, regulating the impact of technology on our lives in particular of artificial intelligence, coping with large flows of refugees and migrants, of course, dealing with pandemics, arms control, transnational organized crime, cyber threats, nuclear safety, I could go on and on. No state, not even the most powerful one, can deal with these challenges on its own. On most of these issues, either there is a cooperative solution or there is no solution at all. Or as Antonio Guterres uh, put it a while ago, uh, I think a couple of years ago, uh, and I quote, in an interconnected world, it is time to recognize a simple truth. Solidarity is self-interest, end of quote. So cooperative security is uh, not an altruistic concept. It is uh, very much an interest-driven uh, policy. At the heart is of cooperative security is conceptualizing security together. 
Uh, it encourages states to jointly identify and prevent threats rather than counter them through uh, deterrence or the use of force. It relies on a demonstration of restraint by all parties. It would privilege dialogue and, and conflict prevention. Cooperative security is uh, an interaction based on principles that have been agreed by the parties themselves. It is about good neighborly relations and uh, minimally a gradual move towards peaceful coexistence. And it's very much about sovereign equality by all parties involved. What does cooperative security require? It requires empathy, a considerable degree of empathy. Understanding that the other side may have a different history, may have a different culture, may have different perceptions, may have different interests, and wants to be treated with dignity and respect. At the core of the cooperative security toolbox is trust building, confidence building measures. That's uh, at the very heart of it. Cooperative security is also very much about predictability and reciprocity. Now I will stop here and leave the floor to the real experts. Um, but before handing the floor uh, back to you, Sasha, I would like to uh, express my deep gratitude uh, to, to Reinhardt, uh, uh, to Matt, and, and to uh, Andre for contributing to our discussion uh, this afternoon. And at the same time, also express uh, my hope that you will uh, stay with our endeavor beyond uh, this uh, launch <laughs> event uh, uh, today. It is uh, back to you, uh, Sasha. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas, for for introducing to us the, the concept of uh, cooperative security, for providing the, the rationale and also explaining the, 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 the intention of, of our events uh, today. Now I will uh, turn to you, uh, Reinhardt, and if I can ask you to, uh, to present us report in more details, maybe you can talk about its methodology and also the scenarios developed in the report. Thanks, happy to do that. Happy to see you all here, even though this uh, a very special environment. I think I'm used to that. Um, and um, also to all the other participants outside Geneva. Thanks um, to the Geneva Center of Security Policy and all the staff. Personally, you, Thomas, of course, for having made this year possible. And clearly, it's not an accident that we're here. Uh, you mentioned this before, um, that uh, Biden and Putin have met here, I think, exactly two weeks ago. They're concerned. And so are we. That, I think, is the underlying uh, reason why we started this CSI. And uh, half jokingly, um, I think simultaneously after um, the two authors, Walter Kemp and me, or the editors, we met at a cafe and called it CSI, the Cafe Spurl Initiative. But really, it's the Cooperative <laughs> Security Initiative. Um, who are we? We, that is 18 experts from the OSC region, and you have a couple um, on the screen. Um, these are people who are concerned, and I'll come back to that, and who are, who are willing to initiate this. Now you can argue, seriously, another report, I mean, how many can we have? 85, 97, why another one? And that's why we started out with questions. You know, the, what is it, the 14 points of Woodrow Wilson, is it 14? So we thought, why don't we start with 18 questions? Because we don't know. We have an idea, but we don't really know. So we started out with 18 questions, made a survey among experts. And you haven't participated, you can argue, you haven't, well, is that that much? But community experts actually is not that, not that little. Um, so what I'm saying is this whole CSI is a process and it is multifaceted. 
Um, we had the experts, we met a couple of times. We also got the support, especially from Thomas Gröminger, the Secretary General at the OSCE at the time, but also from uh, Mr. Leitschak, who was heading the OSCE in person in 1919, uh, 2019, Slovakia, um, and Globsec. Um, so we, meet, we met a couple of times, these experts, to find out how we can come closer to something which might be of interest to you, but also to decision makers. Um, so was the survey we had, and we analyzed the survey, and part of the analyzed survey you find in the final document, which, you, which we have electronically, and you have it here in Geneva in person. We had a whole campaign on social media um, to make sure that each week for 18 weeks, each week one question to get it out, security is of concern. We also had three political um, discussions um, on YouTube with influencers from different areas, climate, just to make sure again, to raise the issue. We are very impressed, not just these 18 experts, you all, that the subject of climate is clearly there now. It hasn't been there for five years ago, but now it's really there. So they made it. They put the issue of climate on the very top. But security, for some reason, seems to be not very interesting. It seems to be for granted, it's peaceful. Geneva looks fantastic, so does Vienna and many other cities. But at the same time, we have a huge conflict in Iran and Ukraine. We had, a, we had a war around Karabakh, again, not in the center of Geneva, but people do get killed in Europe, so it's not good. And that's why Putin and Biden met, because they also think it's not good. And I'm not talking about who is, whose guilt is it, just in general, European security has a problem. That's why we had these talks. That's why we had the social media um, campaign. O also to get it to the people. Peace we cannot take for granted. And because of the support of the OSCE um, and the person of Thomas Gröminger and the Secretariat, because of the support of GlobeSec, which is one of the biggest things in, think tanks in Central Eastern Europe, um, I think we got at least some attention. Now the reason again, why? There's an interesting paradox at the time, at, right now. We would argue, and you would argue too, I think, the status, you know, we, we do have a problem with European security. There is a certain urgency. But on the other hand side, most people would say, even politicians, decision makers in a couple of countries, most countries, the status quo is okay. Now, how does that go? On the one hand side, there's urgency. On the other hand side, the status quo is okay. How can that be? The status quo is not okay, again, for the third time, otherwise Putin and Biden wouldn't have met. Biden has a lot of problems at home, meeting Mr. Putin, he did, because it seems to be we have a security threat. So this was the reason why these 18 experts came together and were thinking what to do. And don't get this report wrong, and I'm, I'm coming to the final report, restoring European security for managing relations to principal cooperation. This is not a handbook, so what do we do? Today, um, it's June 21. What do we have to do on June 21? What about a tumor? Nothing like that. It's about a process. It's about a process of a different trajectory. We are lucky if we can manage relations at the moment. You're reading the papers. You have seen, you see and read about events which could go just plainly wrong. And we know from the archives that during the Cold War, there were a couple of accidents which were that close. And I'm not even talking about the Cuban crisis. So um, it is about a process from managing relations, nothing more than that. This is short term to medium term, what Thomas Gröminger said, possibly at one point looking on the slightest level uh, coming towards trust, but this is still a way we can start before getting trust. And the northern star, or where do we want to go, is definitely some cooperative security, which at the moment you would argue completely crazy. But it doesn't, doesn't it, doesn't, don't we need a horizon somewhere going to? I think this is the idea behind this. We have asked, uh, I told you, um, experts um, what they think 
are options for security in Europe. And again, it's always thought of the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Um, so 14% thinking it will be a battleground. There will be war. 14%, not that many, but still. The second one is cooperative security, only 22%, and I'll come back to that. Groundhog Day, I'm sure you have all seen the movie. You feel like you're coming back to the same moment again and again and again. People think this is also something about security. And 32% think stabilized Europe would be an option, possibly the best. And stabilized Europe means basically managing relations, and this is it. So we think cooperative security, even though only 22% support this, is actually where one should go. And um, again, as I have said, it's about short term. You can have the next slide if you want and can, um, can uh, the auditorium can look at it a bit. Yeah, I mean, we, as you can see, we put a lot of effort in the graphics. Uh, you can smile about this, but basically it is about the bridge cooperative Europe. Battleground Europe is just hopelessly wrong. Groundhog Day is just a circle you go around and around. Stabilized Euro is not that bad and will hopefully join to cooperative security. So cooperative security, you can divide into short term, medium and long term, and you can see it here very well. Um, at the moment, to talk about cooperative security is very counterintuitive. As I said before, you would argue why. Again, um, we're talking about experts who are concerned and I think reasonably concerned. Um, and it is an idea to talk to politicians that yes, to be very precise, deterrence is extremely needed in Europe, what we have. But the second pillar, you might call it conversation, dialogue, or even negotiating, is still there. Remember the Hamel report, 1967, commissioned by NATO? So the second pillar is there, but completely kind of degenerate, degenerate, degenerated, not, not really active at all. It's all about deterrence. And um, for us, for those who, who wrote it for us, who uh, thought about it, um, we just don't want, and I'll almost finish here, and, and I'm using um, a, uh, a title from the book I'm sure you have read. Uh, we don't want to end up like sleepwalkers, meaning you kind of see the signs, but it's kind of okay. And then we are sleepwalking towards something which we don't want. Again. We all, 18, don't want to look as alarmists or possibly crazy or uh, we, not, we need another project. Um, no, this is not what it is. It is real concern, and I'm sure the other three will um, support this. And it's, in a way, a wake-up call. And I will finish with one example. I'm sure you have heard it too, but I just want to repeat it. You could argue, why should we do anything now? We have the we have the uh, KSCE final act of Helsinki. Everybody signed it, the Soviet Union. We have the Paris Charter signed by the Soviet Union. You have even the Astana Declaration from 2010 signed by Russia. So why bother? Just let's come back to this and then we're all set. Well, somehow politics doesn't work that way. And if you argue, but there's no chance in hell that anybody will move now. Look at 1968. Invasion of Czechoslovakia at the time. A couple of years later, the Helsinki process started. And you could argue at the time, why should we do this? And this was an extremely difficult way, and it was never straightforward. There were ups and downs and bumps and everything. But it came to something. And since we have a anniversary, 50 years of the Helsinki final act in 2025, one could, at least from a perspective of experts or scientists or academia say, why don't we use the years from 2021 to 2025 to come up with a couple of cornerstones concerning um, de-escalation, concerning managing relations. Why don't we celebrate 2025, not just was great what we did in 1975, but rather it's great that we have an, a new starting point to make Europe more secure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Reinhardt, uh, for this comprehensive 
overview uh, for for explaining to us uh, the, the involvement of the experts, the involvement of the public, uh, the methodology, but also the scenarios and the building blocks. Uh, I also very grateful for you that you do draw some uh, historical parallels that uh, I think uh, help us very much to understand uh, the, the current situation too. Uh, now I, I would like uh, uh, to uh, give the floor uh, right away to Dr. Matt Rajansky. Uh, Matt, can we ask you to address the U.S. perspective on uh, cooperative security and how could we translate the concepts to make the U.S. audience responsive to that? Matt, please Thank you. Stories. Okay. Thank you very much, Alexandra. Um, this is actually the first time that I'm addressing a, a fully hybrid event of this kind where I can see the audience members, albeit with masks and in kind of a strange fishbowl shape. Um, <laughs> for me, this is actually normal. Normal is to be in a box with a pretend background. I hope mine is very convincing. If you didn't see these pretend <laughs> books, you could see probably real dirty laundry uh, in my bedroom, but uh, this is our reality. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to have the opportunity. And of course, I'm very grateful, Thomas, to you and to GCSP. I hope to be able to visit you in Geneva in the future. Uh, to my, my dear friend, Reinhard and FES, uh, and to Globesec, uh, uh, all of the partners that made this initiative possible. Uh, and it's always fun to, to share the stage with uh, Andre uh, we, we tend to see the world in many of the same ways, uh, and I think that that uh, tends to put us at odds with a great many of our colleagues in both Moscow and Washington. Um, that's also probably testament to our current reality. Um, I've been asked, as Alexandra said, to provide the U.S. perspective on this report and on cooperative security. And of course, the answer is there is no U.S. perspective, um, and I certainly can't provide the U.S. government's view uh, even though that's my employer, I can only speak for myself uh, and uh, from the perspective of one American scholar who, who watches these issues and works on these issues. Uh, but I can give you my own assessment of the report and my sense of how uh, the goals and the recommendations track with U.S. policy as it is right now and the U.S. national interest, uh, which is, of course, my focus. Uh, this, though, the U.S. perspective and, and really more specifically the, the U.S.-Russia dimension is, is only one of the pillars, one of the supports that's needed to underpin this bridge, uh, to use the, the beautiful graphical metaphor, um, although a very busy graphical meta metaphor to the future of European security. Um, for us in the United States, uh, in the wake of a recent uh, tragedy in the state of Florida, where uh, and not particularly old apartment building collapsed completely uh, due to its uh, structural deficiencies. We are engaged in a very intense debate about what we're willing to spend on rebuilding infrastructure. And that really is a metaphor for the challenge that we face now. Uh, not because there's any debate about whether people would rather not have buildings fall apart in the middle of the night uh, so that they fall to their deaths out of their beds, uh, or have highways collapse underneath them, uh, or have trains that are unable to exceed speeds which were reached 150 years ago because the tracks are in such poor condition, uh, or be unable to cope with climate change uh, because our buildings and our power generation are simply not up to the task, or be vulnerable to cyber attacks. All of these are deficiencies of infrastructure that everybody agrees have to be resolved. And yet where there is disagreement is who pays and how much and whether it's worthwhile. Uh, and, and this I think is also a very fitting framework for thinking about the problem of cooperative security in Europe, because there really isn't a lot of debate that if there were a, a peaceful path to European security, if there are a way to have a European security architecture which is durable and inclusive, which supports that bridge, the US-Russia piece of it, the European piece of it, uh, the, the collective region-wide piece of it, et cetera, everyone would agree. The difficulty is exactly who pays the cost and whether it's worth it at this particular moment. So let me say, I think that the, the report takes an eminently practical approach 
Um, although technically, I think I'm not listed among the authors. I was uh, certainly involved in this project, and I endorse uh, the the author's approach. Um, I think they set out the urgency of the issue very compellingly. Um, the argument that's made that diplomacy is not altruistic, uh, that it is not naive, that it is not overly I idealistic, and it's not a reward uh, for good behavior, but rather a necessary, uh, quite realist, clear-eyed step uh, towards advancing the national interests of those countries that engage in it, I think is very compelling. Uh, it's very well said, and in fact, I'll quote in a moment from the report, poor uh, security relationship that underpins the security architecture, which is the relationship between Russia and the West, and that's restore stability and predictability, and if possible, to build from there. That is too difficult and too important a task to be entrusted to officials alone. Civil society, the expert community, like those who contributed to this report, the media and the private sector all have important roles to play in keeping the lanes of dialogue open, especially at times when officials are not doing their jobs, which as we know is quite frequent in this space. Um, and they in turn will have to hold their governments to account. And I think that they do to a considerable degree. Achieving a new European security framework, one that is inclusive and effective, is certainly a vital interest for the United States. Um, on that, I, I think there is little debate. Uh, but the question is, are the prospects for getting there compelling at the moment? And the answer is they are not, especially. Um, they're probably marginally better in the wake of what happened in Geneva two weeks ago. I'm talking about the summit between Presidents Biden and Putin, and it is indeed fitting um, how fortunate for us that, that Thomas can host us virtually or, or physically in Geneva. Um, but it is also a reminder of a time past, some 35 years ago, when Presidents Reagan and Gorbachev met in Geneva, the height of what was then the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union and our allies. Um, we know what happened after that. We know what came before that. And we're living with the consequences of both of them now. Uh, as argued in a book written by uh, a colleague of mine, a former Wilson Center fellow, former ambassador uh, and OSCE high representative in Moldova, Dr. William Hill, uh, who is actually quoted in, in the CSI report as well. His book is called No Place for Russia. Um, he argued that leaving Russia out of the equation in setting Europe's security agenda in the future is not a recipe for success. And I think one could argue that was part of the mistake, that was part of a complex of errors uh, in a macro sense that were made uh, over the past 30 or 35 years coming out of that period of Cold War. This report, I think, is eminently realistic. It recognizes that dilemma, but it recognizes a host of other concerns. It is not single-minded in saying that the solution is simply to undo what we did, to flip from black to white or white to black, and that that will change the outcome. Instead, it recognizes that there's a complex of issues and involvement from all countries will be necessary. Um, it is also acutely conscious of history. Uh, and here I wanna quote directly from the report. History shows that it is hard to achieve peace with Russia and Europe, but there will be no durable peace in Europe without Russia. It should not take a war to rebuild the European security system, uh, as was the case in 1815, 1919, or 1945. Governments must realize that they have a self-interest in cooperating to deal more effectively with the crises of today and to prepare for the threats on the horizon. Let me simply point out that it is not that wars necessarily guarantee a realignment of the security system that will be favorable for states. After all, we have had wars since 1945 without improvement in the European security architecture. I would argue that the most recent war uh, or wars that we are dealing with in the European theater, Ukraine, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, which is heated up again, uh, these wars have, if anything, eroded the framework for European cooperative security. Uh, and so wars guarantee nothing. And yet on the other hand, in cases where we have managed uh, by luck, by sheer accident to escape that framework of war and crisis leading to a necessary realignment, for example, the Charter of Paris of 1990, uh, we have found that those frameworks are not necessarily enduring, that they don't necessarily take into account the core interests of the states involved. So where do we start from now and how do we do a more effective job of taking those interests into account and forging a cooperative security arrangement in Europe? Um, if you think about the way President Biden is approaching the challenge, uh, I think his idea of keeping expectations low and pursuing first stability and predictability as a basis on which to build 
is the right approach. Um, in the wake of the summit that we saw two, two weeks ago, the uh, rhetoric from both sides has calmed to a considerable degree, and this was an important part of provoking uh, the acute crisis point that we were at before. Uh, the politicization of the relationship is still dangerous, but not nearly so dangerous as it was uh, in the weeks preceding the summit. You see greater calm on all sides. Um, the summit hasn't produced uh, a considerable list of takeaways, but there are a few. Number one, the restoration of uh, ongoing arms control or what's called strategic stability dialogue between Moscow and Washington, certainly a positive step. Uh, number two, the apparent desire uh, to negotiate in a serious way about constraints on cyber activity, in particular on the, on the dangerous actions of criminal third parties, uh, ransomware being the most prominent example. And number three, the restoration of diplomatic relations. It may not be full normalization, uh, but it will be a, a, a process of rebuilding, again, infrastructure in the diplomatic relationship. Uh, and that, in turn, will have knock-on effects as civil society uh, and non-government actors are more able then to get the support that they need from the two embassies, which have been obviously uh, reduced to their bare minimum. So all of that is the easy part. The hard part speaks to this question of, is it worth it and who will pay the cost? And this is where speaking as an American and, and as someone who very much supports the administration in its efforts to pursue this line, um, I can see some very big costs. Uh, and these are going to be difficult. They're going to require what we, what we often call just glibly in Washington, toughness. Um, I wrote a few weeks ago in a piece for Politico about what does that toughness mean for President Biden uh, when it comes to dealing with Russia. Let me just say a few words about that. Um, he is going to have to engage in direct negotiations, and those will not be easy because Russia will not give up something for nothing, nor will the United States. Um, so he will have to be tough on the issues. That much is obvious. But he also has to be tough with America's allies and partners. Some will want to see him move much faster and be more forward-leaning and agree to much more resumption of normal diplomatic relations, normal uh, cooperation with Russia. Uh, others, in turn, will view the negotiations with suspicion from the very beginning. They'll want to resist anything that appears to be a, de a deal, anything that appears to be a concession, and they will argue that even talking to Russia uh, is a misguided concession uh, and is cutting deals over the heads of important European stakeholders. A recent example being the French and German proposal for selective engagement with Moscow, uh, which, to say the least, did not receive enthusiastic reception across Europe. Uh, neither did the visit of Mr. Burrell several months ago to Moscow. So skepticism comes on all sides. Um, and speaking of misguided concessions, there, there, there is an argument from what you could call the hawkish camp in Washington that simply says uh, Biden is sleepwalking into a misguided reset, even by talking to Mr. Putin. Um, and to that, I would quote the report in response. The report says, who is being more realistic? A leader who seeks to work with others to address common problems, or one who thinks his country can do everything on its own. Cooperative security is realpolitik based on norms, not on a fantasy. I, I have to say, perhaps without the word realpolitik, which I haven't heard uh, President Biden utter, that exact thought could have come from the White House. This is very much the way I think Washington is thinking about the challenge today. It's not an abandonment of values. It is certainly not a preference for cutting secret deals in smoke-filled rooms over open and transparent dialogue, but it is the recognition that realism is about diplomacy. Realism is not about forcing a zero-sum solution through force of arms. So President Biden has to hang tough in the coming weeks and months to get these negotiations underway, to maintain momentum, to achieve the predictability and stability that he wants in this relationship, uh, and finally, he has to hang tough in the long haul. There will be friends and adversaries at home and abroad. Uh, he will have a successor. He won't last as president forever. And he'll have to hand over uh, to the next president of the United States a more predictable and, uh, and stable relationship and one that can perhaps finally complete the bridge, complete the, the multi-year infrastructure project that he can only begin. Um, and I think that is really the task ahead of President Biden and ahead of Washington today. And I think that this report uh, is extremely useful in providing a framework and in supporting uh, what is, I think, a very wise instinct that's already at the center uh, of attention here in Washington. And I'll simply say in closing that, of course, success or failure uh, is not up to the United States alone. 
This is an enterprise in which our allies and partners in Europe, uh, as well as Russia, will need to share. It takes, uh, in this case, not just two to tango, uh, but uh, the entire European family uh, to engage uh, in this in this infrastructure project together. So thank you once again for giving me the opportunity and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you very, thank you very much, Matt, for your straightforward uh, contribution. You, you raised a lot of uh, interesting topics and I, I think we will come back to many of them during the, the discussion. Um, thank you also for uh, sharing the challenges the new Biden administration meets uh, domestically by promoting this, this dialogue with Russia. And uh, uh, we also see those challenges happening now uh, with our European partners. And I think that's another interesting point to discuss. But first, I would like uh, to uh, give the floor to Dr. Kurtanov uh, for providing us with his analysis of the Russian perspective on, on, on cooperative security. Andrei, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sasha. First of all, let me say that um, I'm grateful for having an opportunity to be here among uh, uh, old friends and uh, like-minded uh, analysts to discuss the issue of uh, cooperative security and uh, the report, uh, which, uh, in my opinion, is an important piece of work. Uh, of course, a skeptical reader can say, well, what do we have here? Uh, we have another uh, group of uh, very naive uh, people uh, who stand for everything good against everything bad. And they came up uh, with a, a rather romantic, uh, but uh, clearly not very realistic paper. I think that it's not the case. And I think that uh, one of the major advantages of uh, this report was that uh, the group of authors and contributors behind the report was a very diverse group. Uh, we had not just uh, people uh, whom I can subscribe to any point that they make, uh, but uh, we had uh, uh, participants coming from uh, Central European states and uh, from the Baltic region. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, the institutional engagement of GLOBSEC is also very indicative. Uh, I have to tell you that I participated in the last uh, GLOBSEC uh, conference uh, just, uh, I, I don't think, maybe a week or two weeks ago. And I can tell you that uh, GLOBSEC uh, is not uh, a very uh, soft institution as far as Russia is concerned. Uh, however, this uh, representation suggests uh, that uh, what we propose uh, is not uh, just uh, a marginal viewpoint. Uh, it's not something that can be easily ignored uh, as uh, having nothing to do with the political reality. Uh, this is something that, uh, in my opinion, deserves uh, consideration and for the development. Uh, when I uh, had a chance uh, to discuss uh, the report with uh, some of my uh, counterparts here in Moscow, uh, I received uh, a couple of lines of criticism of the report and uh, let me outline them in a very short way. First of all, of course, uh, the report is accused of being uh, superficial. Why didn't you touch a particular issue in more detail? Why didn't you focus on climate or, or on the challenge of the pandemic or on sub-regional matters that uh, clearly are very important uh, and uh, might grow in the importance in future? I had to explain that uh, the report is not a roadmap. Uh, it didn't have an intention to provide a specific schedule for approaching particular security challenges that we have in Europe. Uh, but uh, rather, the intention was uh, to define the approach uh, that uh, could be used uh, in analyzing more specific issues uh, and uh, uh, more concrete challenges. 
The second line uh, of uh, criticism that uh, I received was about scenarios. And of course, uh, uh, critics would argue that uh, by uh, uh, drawing various scenarios, the authors and uh, editors of the report try to avoid responsibility because no matter what happens in Europe, uh, uh, would uh, be already there, that would be already predicted in one of the scenarios. Uh, and of course, um, my take uh, has always been that uh, scenarios uh, are an intellectual exercise. Uh, it's not about what is likely to happen, but rather about what could happen in Europe under certain circumstances. Therefore, I think that the scenario method, especially when you talk about uh, expert opinions is uh, definitely justifiable. Uh, and finally, about uh, surveys. Of course, uh, a critic would argue that uh, you shouldn't count on sociological surveys too much because uh, public opinions are volatile. They might shift. You have an event, you have a crisis, uh, you have a summit meeting, uh, and the public would uh, react uh, to this uh, developments, especially if we are talking about uh, people who are interested in international relations and who try to follow current developments in the Euro-Atlantic space. Uh, however, I, I have to say that uh, if you look at the activities of the Aberstift in Vienna, uh, you'll see that they produce uh, many papers uh, with a strong uh, sociological dimension. And what we see there is a spectacular continuity of opinions. I think this is very important, and this is something that uh, uh, should uh, uh, give us reasons to be modestly optimistic uh, about uh, the public moods in Europe, about uh, the uh, attitudes uh, of the European public and the European expert community on many issues. To some extent, I would even argue uh, that uh, societies in Europe uh, are sometimes more mature uh, than uh, uh, than the governments of many European states, and this is encouraging. Uh, now, in terms of uh, what I would like to emphasize specifically for the Russian audience, why this report is important and why we can consider the report as uh, bringing some value added to the table. Uh, first of all, uh, it's important that uh, the report uh, reflects uh, the complexities of the current security crisis in Europe. Uh, unfortunately, quite often we uh, have to confront a very uh, simplified approach uh, to security dilemmas in the Euro-Atlantic space. And the argument is that uh, basically everything was, everything was fine and we lived happily uh, till uh, 2014. Uh, and in the beginning of 2014, uh, one crazy guy in Moscow somehow decided to destroy the European security system uh, for reasons which remain unknown, because no rational reason can explain this decision uh, and the readiness to take the repercussions uh, of the 2014 crisis. Of course, uh, this is a, a simplified approach, and uh, uh, the report suggests that uh, uh, probably we should uh, dig a little bit deeper, probably we should look uh, uh, into the uh, fundamental causes of the current crisis and we should approach 2014 uh, not necessarily as the single cause, but rather as the most graphic manifestation of the crisis. I think it is important uh, and uh, uh, it puts uh, the uh, Ukrainian situation into the right perspective. Uh, uh, second, uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, it is uh, uh, important uh, uh, that uh, the report combines uh, this uh, long-term vision about cooperative security on the one hand uh, uh, and uh, a very practical in incremental approach uh, to handling the situation uh, here and now. Uh, uh, because uh, quite often these two dimensions are detached from each other. On the one hand, uh, you have some very interesting papers speculating about uh, uh, how we can uh, 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 live happily after having restored European security in uh, 20 years down the road. They take a long-term view uh, without uh, identifying how we can get from here to there. 
Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, there is uh, a body of literature and analytical research uh, focused uh, on the immediate goals, on something that uh, can be done now uh, without putting these immediate goals into a broader perspective. Uh, and uh, it's nice uh, to talk about what is doable today, uh, what is practical under the current challenge and circumstances, but still, I think it is very difficult to motivate uh, uh, the public and to motivate the expert community to, incent to incentivize politicians if you do not have a vision. So the report, in my opinion, uh, uh, has the advantage of reconciling the vision uh, with the very practical and incremental steps that uh, should be taken uh, uh, right now. And finally, I think uh, uh, it's important, uh, especially for the Russian intellectual community to square the circle on uh, values. Because uh, on the one hand, uh, uh, clear enough, uh, you cannot ignore values completely. Uh, you cannot take a purely cynical approach that uh, the European security system should be based uh, only on interests because partially interests depend on values. Uh, you cannot uh, exclude the values from the equation. Uh, if there is no understanding about values, it's difficult uh, to talk about uh, predictability and stability of the relationship. On the other hand, uh, if you start with values, uh, the odds are that uh, you will end with values without moving ahead uh, because there is a value gap not between societies, but uh, between political establishments uh, on both sides uh, of the new European divide. Uh, and uh, this is something that uh, is not likely to change uh, anytime soon. So uh, I think that uh, the report puts it uh, again in the right perspective in the sense that uh, uh, convergence of values uh, might be a goal but it should not be a precondition for starting working together. Uh, some convergence of values might uh, emerge at a later stage uh, when we are closer to the ideal concept of uh, cooperative security, uh, but we will have to move in this direction uh, and this movement. I, and uh, uh, it was a very clear contrast uh, with the decision of the European Union not to have a meeting with Vladimir Putin uh, at the uh, top level. I think uh, what we will see now uh, in Moscow is a temptation to focus uh, primarily uh, on dealing with Washington. And I think that uh, the uh, logic will be that, uh, look, uh, uh, we cannot really uh, talk to Europeans uh, because uh, uh, they uh, are not really uh, independent. Uh, they do not have a strategic autonomy from the United States, uh, and uh, uh, they cannot agree among uh, themselves whether they want to talk to Moscow or not. So uh, let's uh, focus on uh, the security dialogue with the United States, because in the end of the day, uh, uh, NATO is nothing but uh, an extension of the US military power uh, in the Euro-Atlantic region. And I think that uh, it would be a mistake, uh, though a dialogue with the United States is really important, and uh, in uh, many ways the United States is an indispensable uh, security player and a partner for the Russian Federation, but I think that it is still quite important uh, to put the strategic uh, agenda uh, into a multilateral format. Uh, and uh, here, I would like to refer to the role that OECE can play. I think OECE remains a, a very important, I would even say a critical instrument uh, to promote this uh, multilateral agenda. And uh, I would like uh, the Russian side uh, to uh, invest more uh, energy and political capital uh, in uh, working uh, with the uh, OECE. Uh, second, uh, I'm uh, concerned about potential cherry picking uh, from the Russian side, because indeed, uh, since there is no unity in the European Union, there will be a temptation to focus uh, primarily on relations uh, 
uh, with uh, specific member states uh, to work uh, with Paris, uh, to work with Rome, uh, to work with Berlin. Of course, uh, working with Berlin will largely depend on the outcome of the next parliamentary elections in Germany. But if the current uh, coalition stays in power, definitely the temptation will be there. And again, in my opinion, that would be wrong. I think it is important uh, to talk not only to those uh, who are, are ready to work with you, but also to your opponents. So if I were to advise the Russian leadership, I would suggest that it should uh, invest uh, much more than it does right now into uh, trying to restart a dialogue with its critics in Europe, including Baltic states and Poland uh, and uh, some other countries uh, which are now skeptical uh, of uh, uh, working uh, with Moscow. And finally, and let me add with that, uh, I think that uh, what Putin did in Geneva, uh, he said uh, his uh, red line, and his red line was this alleged interference of the West into Russia's domestic affairs. Uh, uh, Putin has always emphasized uh, sovereignty. I think it's important uh, uh, characteristics of the Russian statehood and of the uh, current situation. I don't want to question uh, this priority, but uh, I think that we should all keep in mind that uh, human rights uh, cannot be regarded as uh, purely domestic political issues, that uh, there is at least an element of universality in the human rights agenda, and this is something uh, that uh, should not be forgotten. And finally, let me say that uh, I have a lot of admiration uh, for the stamina and commitment of uh, those uh, who, uh, are, who were involved in this initiative and who can continue working on the uh, applications of uh, multilateralism to the European security agenda. It's not the flavor of the season. It's not something that will easily become the major trend in the European politics, but I think that the harder we push for multilateralism, the sooner its time will come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andre. Very comprehensive and insightful presentation. You all outline uh, the Russian criticism to the report. You provided your responses, your recommendations. You also spoke about the next step from the Russian side, and in particular, was interesting that you mentioned uh, investing in the OEC uh, in the framework of the European uh, security. And I think that gives us an excellent introduction to our next uh, presentation, uh, Dr. Fred Tanner. Uh, Fred, I would be grateful if you could, could provide the, the European take uh, on, on what we have been discussing. Please, the, the, the mic is yours. Thank you very much, Sasha. And also thanks for giving me an opportunity to uh, give a short presentation uh, in this uh, illustrious panel uh, of this afternoon. Um, I really talk more from an OEC perspective. I actually have uh, together with uh, Reinhard Krum uh, at the time really engaged in the CSI through uh, from an OEC uh, vantage point together with my colleague Ante Wusharnik. And so I think I'd like to take away a few points from that period uh, as uh, uh, Andre and Matt uh, have already together, of course, with Reinhard covered most uh, of, of the, the points. Uh, and um, just the departure point, I think, for, for me has really been that we are in a Groundhog Day slash Battlefield Europe situation today. And anything has to be done to not to sleepwalk, as Ryan has referred to, into, into a, a disaster, which is really waiting around the corner. And so to, to come back to this kind of a metaphor of building an infrastructure, which could be resilient, which could help to avoid uh, actually situations we have seen right now, actually, in the Black Sea, uh, certain show, showdowns, uh, completely unnecessary possibly getting Mediterranean, what can be done based on the OECE um, commitments and acquis? Uh, and here, I'd like first to highlight the role of principles. Again, 
OECD is a normative soft uh, security organization uh, and principal cooperation has been highlighted by CSI. And of course, here we need to refer to the Helsinki Final Act um, and uh, with the recommendation to have uh, very soon in about four years, a kind of summit meeting, a high level meeting where there would be an opportunity to restore and to kind of recommit to principal cooperation. It really has the assumption that right now, uh, and I would make this argument, there's no consensus on actually what underlying principles there are for security cooperation in Europe. I just read yesterday a very interesting article by Foreign Minister Lavrov, a kind of longish article on law and rules. And, and he made some interesting points about how the same word translated has different meanings, meanings and can really lead to a lot of misunderstandings. Uh, and, and here, I think uh, it's important that work is, is being done. He, by the way, forgot to mention one important uh, principle of the Helsinki Final Act, namely the inviolability of frontiers uh, and respect of human rights. Um, but then, of course, they all up more from a, almost an academic uh, side uh, and interesting uh, uh, arguments. Now, in addition to the necessity to review how to agree on the principles and better understand them, have a common sense, a shared sense of what the principles are and how to live up to them is uh, the uh, other building block of the OEC is uh, of course the confidence building measures. There's a very strong acquis. I mean, the acquis has been much stronger in the past. There has been the CFE, the, the, the Conventional Force in Europe Agreement, the Open Skies Agreement and the Vienna document, uh, and the trilogy basically. And now there is only the Vienna document left. Actually two weeks ago at the NATO summit, there was a lot of attention paid to this Vienna document because NATO realized too, it's the only kid in town, if I could say so. Right now it's the only agreement left, multilateral agreement left on military risk reduction and transparency building measures in Europe. Not to forget that all 30 NATO member states are of course also participating states in the OACE. And they try now to push certain agendas with regard to the Vienna document through, of course, through the OSCE. One, one recommendation which was, uh, which came out of the summit uh, communique of, of the NATO meeting was a request to agree on modernization of the Vienna document in Stockholm at the Ministerial Council meeting, which is coming up in December of this year. It means modernization of that document in view of being now really the only reference document to avoid conflicts, uh, risks, uh, reductions, transparency building, should be better able to capture loss, large scale military exercises, large scale troop movements, as we have seen recently at the Ukrainian Russian border, where actually the document has been activated, some mechanisms, but also snap exercises and military to military crisis management, quite a few recommendations, how to improve the ability in Europe of military crisis management. Uh, there is another mechanism within the OEC, that's a structured dialogue, dealing more with political military. It's a political military platform where uh, of course the United States and Russia are part. It's an inclusive platform with a lot of good ideas of military to military cooperation. So, and of course here also it's, excuse me, it's about risk reduction, it's strengthening crisis management mechanism, but also to avoid dangerous military encounters, which of course is very, a very topical view today. I mean, I have the feeling there is on the very strategic atmospheric uh, with the Geneva summit uh, kind of calmer situation, but on the ground, if you look at what's happening right now, there's a lot of contempt and a lot of threats, actually even bombs being dropped to the nigh access of certain ships in certain areas. So I think there is a lot of need to work in this area. And I think the OEC has the instruments to that. How this can be leveraged? 
basically. Um, and, and here, of course, we have a lot of, as has been mentioned, a lot of very valid expert reports. I just like to remember, uh, mention the recommendations of the participants of the expert dialogue on NATO Russia military risk reduction in Europe. A recent very good report, I think Andre Kortunov was there, but also GCSP has been represented with Mark Fino. And also I'd like to refer to the NATO 2030 report, expert report. A lot of good points, a lot of action points. It also recommends to return to the dual track, kind of like Harmel type of cooperation with Russia. Unfortunately, the NATO summit itself did not really pick up that language. Then it needs to be broadened. I think uh, Matt made that point already. Um, we cannot leave this kind of process to diplomats only, include primarily parliamentarians, young people, civil society, the private sector too, and think tanks as well as media. And finally, I think we need to, and we built this kind of nice buildings. Uh, the graphs are really fantastic, uh, Reinhardt, in this CSI uh, report, how to, uh, how to navigate around the mines and the little minefields which exist and the spoilers which are waiting out there. And I think I'd like, just like to very, uh, identify two important areas. One is the, we need a better understanding of national narratives. There's so many different narratives floating around today. I just saw one actually by President Putin who wrote an article in Die Zeit, which was published afterwards in English language too. He talks with regard to Belarus about a coup attempt, attempt by the West. Or at the Moscow Security Conference, General Cherasimov uh, accuses the West to creating a unipolar world, exclusionary of course, with hinting that the uh, new exclusive club with the Alliance for Multilateralism or the Summit for Democracy initiative would of course leave a country like Russia behind. And the second point in this kind of uh, navigation around uh, minefield is really to drop any kind of preconditions when it comes to engagement in dialogue. Here, I'd just like to quote very briefly uh, for Minister Lavrov's uh, point at the, at the uh, Moscow Security Conference. He said, equality, mutual respect, and the search for fair balance of interests rather than ultimatums we keep hearing and which demand that Russia change its ways before the West even agrees to talk to us. That's of course an area which I think work has to be done, more dialogue. I mean, also NATO actually has uh, made clear that until Russia demonstrates compliance with international law and its international obligations, and responsibilities, there can be no return to business as usual. So to, how to, to conclude, how to feed these kind of recommendations we have, drawing from CSI and proposals we heard today into the political process. I think first, there's a lot of top-down work process going on now. It needs to give more space to civil society and expert communities. There should be more pressure. I think Ryan R. Krum made that point. And mobilization from bottom up too. We should tackle the clash of narratives. We should remove conditionalities for dialogues, more dialogues to multiple levels and more agreed normative basis on cooperation. And finally, as we are having this event at the GCSP, I'd like also to recommend to translate CSI recommendation into training curriculum and share this curriculum across all of our networks. Okay, thank you, Sasha, for, uh, thank you for your attention and uh, voila, back to you. Thank you, thank you very much, Fred, uh, providing the, the OEC perspective, you named the roles, uh, role of the OEC principles, the CSBM's uh, importance of uh, agreeing on modernizing the Vienna document, the importance to continue the structured dialogue. Uh, you flagged also the importance of understanding each other's narratives, and that's why we will come back here again on this difference of perceptions of one side, uh, each side have of, of uh, uh, another, and, and finally for providing recommendations on how to feed the, 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 the report recommendations to the political process. Thank you very much for that.